Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Japanese 101 Lesson 4. Can you believe it's already Lesson 4? Feels like just yesterday when I started this whole thing. Thanks, uh, sound from outside. So, quick recap of last week. Last week we talked about adjectives, alright? Um, we talked about saying how certain things can have certain attributes, and that's usually described with adjectives, such as something is long, something is strong, something is wide. All of these things are adjectives. And we talked about things such as the um, fact that E adjectives sort of work as predicates themselves, and Na adjectives rely on the copula to make a sentence work. We haven't really discussed past tense adjectives, so last week was a very new bit of grammar. Ah, there you go, yeah. Um, books and making, yeah, so, and we also talked about tenses a little bit, like past tense um, of adjectives and the negative of adjectives. And, um, again, usually I would tell you to review that stuff. It is, I mean, the recording, to be fair, the recording is here on Twitch, so it is available. It's just not on YouTube yet, um, and I will be fixing that as soon as possible. But... Today, I want to talk about verbs. Now, don't get too scared by this, because we're going to talk about verbs a lot. This is sort of chapter one, verbs, okay? This is sort of, um, this is sort of verbs, the intro, okay? So today, what we're going to talk about is the type of verbs, okay? We're going to talk about um, types of verbs, or groups of verbs, you know, verb groups, let's say. We're going to talk about verb groups. We're going to talk about, um, you know, like the verb groups, how to differentiate them and stuff like that. And we're going to talk about some like very basic conjugation. That's that's basically all we're going to do today. Basic conjugation, just like the very basics. All right. So those are those are really the two big things that we're going to talk about today. Um, discuss past and will you bit and really only discuss e adjectives. I will look and try. Yes, do look and try. That sounds like a good idea. <laughs> so, tag along with me as we journey forth into this abyss that is verbs. Now, first of all, I think we should talk about what a verb is, okay? Um, now, if you were... That's interesting. Oh, no, have I been drawing on this? That is unfortunate. Let me get rid of this then. Should not have done that. <laughs> That's okay. How far back can I go? Ah, there we go. I have been drawing on the wrong layer. Which explains why the delete thing was being weird. So, let's talk about what verbs are first. Lesson four. Verbs. Again, this is just the intro to verbs. I think actually next week we're gonna do verbs part two, like immediately. Um, while it makes sense. So, first of all, what is a verb, okay? That feeling when no teke. <laughs> yes, teke is gonna definitely be later. So, um, what is a verb? If you remember the first lesson, then we kind of did talk about that a little bit. And it is also in the first document. That one is available for everyone. I wanted to make a command for that, but I kind of forgot. Maybe I'll get that done later. So, what is a verb? Um, a verb is a class of words, really, like a part of speech, just like nouns and adjectives and everything else, um, just that verbs have a pretty important role in most languages, especially in Japanese. Um, verbs are doing words. Verbs describe actions, okay? So in English, what is a verb is like, to run is a verb, right? Because it describes, it describes the action of running. So, um, you know, you may have seen this at school, you know, these, these so-called like doing verbs or whatever, uh, doing words, I should say. Like, the doing words. Um, they're actions. They're actions, okay? Doshi. Yeah, that's right. Dai-chan. Um, in Japanese, they're called doshi. Um, doshi is also kind of interesting if you, if you look at the word doshi, right? Just kind of written like this. Um, doshi. Um, I think that, yeah. Doshi, which is basically this is do is ugoku to move, right? So it's like a movement, and this is like part of speech word. It's like a movement word, kind of in a way, you know. Um, doshi, if if you want to look at it like that, kind of makes sense as well. Goes into a similar category as the doing word in um, English. Now, 
not only in English, in, uh, not only in Japanese, in English as well, but in Japanese especially, the verb is very important. Um, there's this famous, almost a famous sentence that you could see online probably, um, I think Takem mentions it in his guide as well, is that the most basic Japanese sentence is just a verb. It's just a predicate. Um, this includes something like a copula or a, um, a e adjective. You know, that's like the simplest sentence would just be that, just the predicate, really. Luigi san, konnichiwa. Hai, genki desu yo. Um, so you can see that if, if the minimum unit of a sentence, um, like literally the minimum that you can go is a verb, then the verb is apparently pretty important or the predicate itself. Um, and by the way, I keep using this word predicate. Uh, now predicate is maybe a little bit of a broader term. Um, predicate is basically the part of a sentence that contains the verb or the copula or like that sort of function, right? So the reason the predicate can be kind of a nice terminology to use is, for example, what we talked about last week is that e adjectives by themselves can be in the role of a predicate. For example, when I say something like kono keiki ga oishi, this cake is delicious, then this is a complete sentence. Even though it doesn't contain a verb, strictly speaking, it's just that in e adjectives, um, the the copula, the state of being sort of um, functionality is almost baked in. So e adjectives themselves can function as predicates. They can fill that role, that role in the sentence of the predicate. So we don't need a verb to make it a complete sentence. In almost all, any other case, you would need a copula or at least a verb to make that a completed sentence, except for e adjectives. But then again, arguably, they just come with that baked in. There you go. Okitemita. <laughs> Okitemita. You tried to get up, Gendry? Hello. Okitekita. That sounds fun to say, no? Okite kita. Mm, okite kita. Mm, okita. I feel like usually you just say okita. Or uh, this. So um, this and da are. It, it, they're verb like. I've had discussions about this. It kind of depends on how you look at it. Um, they are pretty verb like. They usually show up in places where verbs would show up. Um, they function very verb-like, but they also do lots of things that verbs can't, that verbs don't, and verbs do things that they can't. So it's kind of hard to say. Um, if you remember last week, the Wikipedia definition even says that copulas are usually verbs or verb-like words. So I would say these are fall into the category of a verb-like word. You want tabete mita? Is this right? Mite is try to do the verb. Tabete mite. Yeah, try and eat. That's correct. That's good. You can use miru like that. So, now that we know what a verb is, plus or minus, and again, a few examples in English would include stuff like to run, to go, to sleep, all of these actions are verbs. Um, let's look at verbs in Japanese, okay? Now, as I introduced earlier, we're going to talk about groups first, okay? So, groups of verbs, which, um, broadly speaking, there's only... Three. There you go. That was like a very dramatic way of saying the number three. Um, there's only really three groups of verbs. Okay, so let's go into verb groups. Um, verb groups. Now, the um, yeah, because the copula isn't really an action per se, right? Yeah, not really. It's more a state. It's more a state of being. If you if you want to quote take him, it's like a state of being rather than an action. But like you could say that just being something is an action in itself. It's like, mm, you know. So um, what are verb groups? Now I mentioned there's three. So one, two, and three. Um, <laughs> you may find other terms out there. Okay. Um, and I'm going to try and mention... I'm having a deja vu here. Yeah, I did something similar a long time ago. Well, not a long time ago. But today is going to be a little bit more basic and not as long. So you'll find different terms out there. And I'm going to try and make this as easy as possible and as consistent as possible. For that reason, I will introduce most of the terms that I know and group them into the right categories. And then we will sort of go with the terms that I find the best. Okay, because after all, this is my series. So my... Um, the thing that I get to do is basically pick and choose what I find is the easiest way of doing things. So 
Um, what are the three groups of verbs? Maybe let's start with group number three. Uh, I can't talk. Group number three, okay? Um, which may sound a little bit strange, but if we start here, I think um, most group, most textbooks, most guides will call this a similar way, but group number three is basically just the irregulars. Irregular. Um, irregular. Irregular. So that, you know, that's just... Our group number three is like that bucket that nothing that you know, we put things in that don't fit in the other two. Okay, um, lucky for us, there's only two of these. Um, generally, in Japanese, when you consider all verbs, only two of them are really considered irregular. And um, for someone who has maybe tried to learn French or English or German or any other language, you will probably rejoice thinking that wow, only two irregular verbs. And you'd be right, because it is really that easy. Um, only two verbs have fairly irregular conjugations, and everything else falls into these two neat categories in modern Japanese, um, as we will see in this and the next episode. So, you only really have two irregular verbs. Um, there's other textbooks out there that call these class three verbs, I think. I think Genki would call these class three, but I'm not 100% sure. So. Um, yeah, so if you see class 3 out there, that's usually what this means is irregular verbs. Um, and I can, since there's only two of them, um, I can list them because it's easy, right? It's only two. So what are these two verbs? It's just suru and kuru. Suru and kuru. Let's do a Japanese comma the other way around. Kuru. Suru and kuru. What do suru and kuru mean? Well, they're verbs, so they have to be some sort of action, as far as we know, right? So what do we have? We have suru. Hey! Um, Lei Requam, am I reading that correctly? Thank you so much for the follow, and also thank you for being follower 100 and, uh, sorry, follower 1111. Now, if that isn't a nice number, pat yourself on the back for that one. Thank you so much, welcome. Um, you have suru, which means to do, and callous. Thank you for the follow. Foro, arigato gozaimasu. You have um, suru, which suru has a lot of meanings. Um, it's a pretty versatile ver word, a pretty versatile verb. Um, but maybe if you just remember it as to do, it's probably a good way of remembering it, to do. And then all these other meanings, which sort of fall into similar categories, has a little bit to do with phrasing as well. So e o bini suru, for example, here means to, yeah, to place, to pers person A to a post or a status, yeah, something like that. So, suru is that. Uh, aru is kind of irregular too. Yeah, that's true, it's weird that aru is... So, aru is also like um, an interesting verb that we should probably look at. Um, it's just usually not considered in this group, which is interesting. I don't really know why, but conventionally, kuru and suru are the ones that are considered to be in group 3. And not aru, even though... You're kind of right, Aru has a little bit of an interesting negative form. Um, so yeah, Kuru just means to come. That's basically that. Yeah. Arguably, you could say Aru would be like the other, like, irregular one. But for now, let's uh, consider these groups and let's talk about Aru in a bit. Because Aru is very important to conjugation overall. So what are the other two groups? Well, the other two groups are... Um, and I'm gonna do... The terminology that I'm going to use first. So for group one, um, or for the first group, we're gonna look at ichidan verbs, okay? Ichidan verbs, okay? Ichidan um, has a Japanese is the Japanese name of that. I like it the best. And group two would be godan, okay? Godan. Now, if you look up these terms, ichidan and godan, in the dictionary, you'll quickly see that it looks something like this. Ichidan. So yeah, ichidan verb. There you go. So well, what is this kanji? Okay, I feel like it's important that if I show you this terminology, then why do I use this? Okay, the reason I use this is because it makes the most sense to me. All right. So ichidan um, consists of just looks like one. Yeah, and that's that's what I want you to remember. Okay, when we're gonna talk about ichidan and um, Ooh, this is new. Inspect kanji. Um, if we're gonna look at these conjugations, uh, what I want you to remember is that one of them has something to do with one, ichi, and the other one has something to do with five, go, okay? And the dan is the same. So think of these as verbs with like one step and five steps. Hiribu-san, konnichiwa. So ichi dan, right? One step. And go sounds like five, yeah? So like go dan is five steps. 
五段。You'll see 五段五段 verb conjugation. Okay, 五段 Again, the dan is the same, and the go is five. So the reason I use these terms is because it makes a lot of sense、um, once we look at conjugation patterns themselves. So you'll see that ah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense for this to be one and five.、Um, so again, this is here. This is steps or stairs. Think of them as five steps versus one step. And why that is, we will talk about.、Um, other names for these. Will be something like so. Ichidan is often called.、Um, uh, often these are either called ru verbs. I'm I'm seeing that I don't run out of space here. These will sometimes be called ru verbs, or、um, iru eru verbs. Okay, and then、um, these will often be called u verbs instead. Now. This is not the most accurate name, in my opinion. Again, which is why I'm I'm going to go with ichidan and godan. I, if you remember this, I in my opinion is the easiest way of remembering them.、Um, u verbs and ru verbs, and also maybe another name that I should mention. So this is sometimes called、um, a class two verb for some reason.、Um, I think minna no nihongo or something, or not genki. I don't think, but like minna no nihongo. Textbook uses class two for for ichidan and class one for godan verbs and class three for irregulars. That one I don't really like endorse at all because it's just arbitrary.、Um, but yeah, okay, it makes the most sense compared to the others. Yeah, in my opinion, it's like the easiest way of remembering which is which. Okay, now. Um, let's forget about three for now, okay? So remember, there are these two irregulars. Thank you, both these illogical terms. Illogical.、Uh, let's forget about irregulars for a bit, okay? And let's just look at ichidan and godan, and let's look at what these are and how they are different, okay? And how you recognize them, which is the most important part, because you have to recognize which verb,、uh, which group it is, so that you can, you know, know how to conjugate them. Now the the nice part about Japanese conjugation is that once you've basically figured out which group a verb belongs in, then you can basically do any conjugation that you'll ever want to do. There's like two things you need to know about a verb, and you can do any conjugation. So how do we differentiate? So、um, if we had like a a split down the middle here, and we had、um, ichidan here, ichidan, and we had godan over here. Again, remember,、um, ichi from one and、uh, go from five, right? So one and five. Okay, this will come back in a bit.、Um, how do you recognize an ichidan verb? So if you remember, again,、um, they were called iru eru verbs. So iru eru. Any ichidan verb will rhyme in iru or eru. Okay, so let's、um, use a dictionary. Oh yeah, another reason why I use ichidan and godan is because the most prominent dictionaries will use that terminology as well. So might as well learn that because here, all it tells you is ichidan verb. So you kind of have to know it anyways, right? Because a lot of dictionaries use this terminology as well. So might as well learn it that way, in my opinion. So taberu is、um, to eat, which is clearly a verb, and it's an ichidan verb. Now. If we write it down,、uh, so kanji aren't going to be very important today, by the way.、Um, so you can mostly work this out with katakana,、uh, with hiragana only.、Um, taberu. Taberu. So you can see this rhyming thing that I talked about. This clearly rhymes with eru because you have this eru in here. Okay, eru.、Um, An example that would be an ichidan verb that rhymes with iru would be something like um, okiru, um, okiru, which means to get up, to get out of bed. Okiru. You can see here again ichidan verb okiru. Okay, so this clearly is the example that this one rhymes with,、um, you know, iru, and miru.、Um, yeah, miru is a good example as well. So we have these two categories.、Um, Okiru, okiru. So this this rhymes in iru.、Um, so we have eru here and iru down here. Okiru and taberu. So these are these are two ichidan verbs. Okay. Now, 
What are Godan verbs? Well, basically the answer is everything else, okay? Everything that isn't an Ichidan verb is either suru kuru, like the exception, or it's a Godan verb. Okay, that's really as easy as it is. So let's use, um, let's let's look for a different verb. Like for example, if any ichidan verb always has to rhyme with iru and eru, then by definition, like a verb that doesn't end in the uh, in the hiragana ru can't be an ichidan verb, right? So let's let's look at one. For example, yomu yomu means to read. Okay, yomu. Now we can see that this ends in mu. So it, it can't be an ichidan verb, because how could something ending in mu even rhyme with iru or eru? It can't, right? So easy enough, right? Now, if all things were as easy as that, then there would be no troubles in our lives. And of course, there are exceptions to this rule. There's quite a few, actually. Um, and there's really no good way of, you know, um, recognizing the exceptions other than just learning it. So a famous exception is uh, kaeru. Uh, kaeru means to go home. Kaeru. Um, kaeru means to go home. And you can see that this clearly rhymes in eru. Kaeru. And yet. And yet it's a godan verb. Why is it a godan verb? Whoa, thanks. Why is it a godan verb? It just is. It doesn't matter, okay? This is, yeah, this is like the e, the not adjectives that end in e. This is just something that exists, okay? So godan verbs here, I'm going to write it down right away so you can see it. Um, kaeru, to go home. Um, kaeru. Um, go home. By the way, there is other verbs that sound like kaeru, but they are, in fact, uh, ichidan verbs, like to change. Uh, kaeru, like this. This is actually an ichidan verb, which makes it even more confusing. But also the pitch is different, so I guess, you know, this is um, kaeru. <laughs> so, um, there are verbs that this verb literally looks basically the same in hiragana, and yet this is an ichidan verb, and this is a godan verb. So, there is exceptions to this. But at least, so the saving grace is, you know, um, like, if it doesn't end, like, um, if it ends in, um, yeah, like, um, doesn't wait. That's not how you write. If it's if it's how should I say this? Like, um, not rhyme with iru eru. Always go done. Okay. Always go done. I don't know if you can read this. Iku go done verb. Yeah. So I wonder if it's go done so that you can tell them apart. Uh, eh, not really. I mean, there's other verbs that sound the same, and they're both in the same class. I thought the way okurigana happens was related to this. No, not really. So there, we've looked at this in the past, and there's examples for both in both classes, I think. There, they may be related. Are there more ichidan verbs or godan verbs? So that's a good question that I get all the time. And I would say that vastly more ichidan? Are you sure? I don't know. Like, there's so many verbs. Like... When I read like a page in a book I don't, or, or like a whole book, I don't really net recognize this kind of thing. I don't think there's many more in either class, but maybe there, there may be. So let's, <laughs> the best answer I can give you is that the distribution between Ichidan and Godan verbs isn't as extreme, um, it isn't as tilted one way as for me to realize it. Like I never really realized a tip of the balance one way or the other. So there is like a distribution there. There's a lot of them either way. There's a lot of Ichidan verbs. There's a lot of Godan verbs. Um, I would say there's probably more Godan verbs to be honest because you have more options with Godan verbs. Well, all the different conjugations make Ichidan verbs. <laughs> That's fair enough, but at that point, it's we're gonna talk about that. But the thing is, um, at that point, you're talking about auxiliaries, right? So like the rareru is an auxiliary verb, which is an Ichidan verb. Right, like rareru itself is kind of like its own verb, and once you add that, then yeah, it's it's an ichidan because then you only look at the last verb in the chain. But let's not we'll talk about that in a much later point. So now one thing that we need to mention is that um, you've probably already seen this pattern, or maybe you haven't, um, which is why I will show you something real quick. Let me 
get a screenshot. So I'll take a screenshot. Now, the interesting thing about verbs in Japanese is that they all end in some kana that is u. So here. Um, these are all, this, this is basically part of the kana table. And you can see that uh, in this table, all of these, okay, are, th this is basically what we would call, um, this is what we would call um, ugyo, right? Um, which is the um, the row in the kana table that is all the u sounds. U, ku, su, tsu, nu, hu, mu, yu, and ru. So, um, all verbs, like the whole bunch of them, every single verb in Japanese has to end in one of these sounds or one of them with uh, dakten or handakten, okay? So what I mean by this, so for for uh, hu, you also have the option of it being bu, okay? For um, su, you, well, this doesn't really happen. For ku, you have the option of it being gu. Um, what else? There's not super many. Uh, zu doesn't really happen. I don't think there's modern Japanese verbs that end in uh, zu. There's also, additionally, um, there's no verbs in modern Japanese that end in yu. So this doesn't happen for verbs. Um, and there, let me see, there is no verbs in modern Japanese that end in fu either. Okay. And there's only one that ends in yu. Uh, nu, sorry. There's only one that ends in nu. Okay, so there's some some rules there. Um, the one that I mean, of course, is shinu, um, shinu to die. That's basically the only one. Um, shinu, shinu, yeah, shinu to die, right? This is clearly a godan verb again. Like, notice the pattern. This doesn't end in a ru, so it has to be a godan verb, um, obviously. Now, the only other one that I can even think of uh, that would end in nu would be inu. Uh, inu like this, um, this kanji, this inu, this is like the only other one, but it's already considered archaic. Um, like this isn't really, like, um, you basically already step out of the bounds of what's considered like modern Japanese at that point. So it's fair enough to say that modern Japanese only has one, um, verb that ends in nu, um, because inu isn't really used. It's not like, inu isn't like an everyday word. But every other, like, this is, like, this row of the kana table is literally all you need, and you'll know all verb endings that can exist. That's very useful for us. You'll see in a bit, if we ever get, if we get into the conjugations, you'll see in a bit that if we can sort of have an exhaustive list of all the verb endings that can exist, that makes it really easy for us to make sure we get all the conjugations. Jeez, my, my nose is super itchy right now, I don't know why. But does that make sense so far? Inu wa inu. So, no. This is in a way also like kaeru, but yeah. So, again, every single verb in Japanese has to end in one of these. U, ku, or gu, su, tsu, nu, bu, mu, or ru. I said ru really weird there. So, these are all our options. And, additionally, if it does not end, if it does not end in ru, then it's automatically godan. So we can make like a thing here and say like this and this is always godan, okay? So this is the godan area, right? From from here to here is the godan area. Like, because it has to, in the end, for it to be ichidan, it has to rhyme with iru or eru. It just happens that some of them that rhyme with iru and eru are still godan verbs. But that doesn't mean that anything that doesn't rhyme in iru and eru can even be an ichidan verb. So that means that anything that will be in this group from mu or tsu or whatever will be automatically a godan verb. We can exclude everything else. It's very nice, you know, it's very easy for us to remember. Alright, so that's ichidan and godan. Um, again, keep in mind two things. Number one, um, all kana, uh, sorry, all verbs have to end in an u sound. One of one of these that I marked here. Number two, there is ichidan and godan are the big main groups, um, and all ichidan verbs end in iru eru, and all godan verbs 
are like the ones that aren't ichidan. So first of all, the ones that don't don't end in ru at all or don't rhyme in iru eru are always godan verbs. And then there's some exceptions of ones that do rhyme with iru eru, like um, kairu, and they are still godan verbs. Okay. Now, if right now you're wondering, but Eve, I still don't know how to conjugate them. That's fine. That's literally we're gonna get to that point. Just for now, remember this, okay? Uh, because once you are able to differentiate godan verbs from ichidan verbs, you will also basically be able to conjugate them once you learn the patterns. And the patterns apply like wide scale over all ichidan and all godan verbs. So you, it's like literally a thing you learn once and then you never have to worry about it again, which is very nice. Okay, let me clear some space and then we are actually first thing that we're gonna look at is the conjugation pattern for aru real quick. Um, so let me delete some stuff. I'm gonna delete this and I'm going to get rid of all this. All right, if you have questions, feel free to ask them now. Um, let's look at aru. Okay, aru is it, so um, who was it? Hey or someone? Or, or maybe it was seriously. So, so someone mentioned that Aru is like a little bit irregular too. Um, that is kind of true. So let's look at Aru. So which um, Aru in general? Let's let's maybe make that yellow. Aru. Yeah, it was seriously. There you go. So Aru. Now, strictly speaking, there's actually three Arus. Okay. Aru. If you look it up in the dictionary, you'll see um, broadly that um, yeah, there's there's basically three of them. So um, first one would be yeah aru. Um, so the first one would be to exist, which is aru. This one to be to exist to be for inanimate objects. So there's aru and there's iru. Okay. So um, the first thing you're gonna have want to know is that there's two verbs aru. And iru. We're only really gonna look at the conjugation of aru, okay? Because the iru conjugation is ichidan. Iru is just ichidan. It's it's completely uh, iru himas, ina, i, iru is completely regular. Um, so there's aru and iru. So iru is completely regular conjugation. So if you know like if you can conjugate taberu, you can conjugate iru. Um, but aru is for existence of inanimate objects like furniture or you know, a tree, anything that doesn't really move around. Tree, you could argue, is like animate to a degree, but I mostly it's considered inanimate as far as the grammar is concerned. Um, or like a car or something like that. Um, yeah, iru is, is, is everywhere, that's true. So you have aru and iru. These both just mean to exist or to be, right? Aru for inanimate objects. Now, the reason I mention aru specifically here is that it's very important because it shows up in the conjugation of other verbs, which is kind of special, right? Most of all, it's negative kind of shows up there. Robots. So robots are a bit, a bit of a, a bit of a middle thing. So you could use aru for robots, or if you wanted to make a point that the robot is very like human-like, you would definitely use iru. Like if the robot has a name, like uh, ashimo, you would definitely use iru. Call those existence verbs. Yeah, you can you can call them existence verbs if you want. Now, the interesting point about the uh, aru is that if you're speaking very, very strictly, there's three different arus. Um, one of them isn't even a verb, okay? So aru to exist, to be. And then aru, most of all, if it's with this kanji, it means to possess, to have, to possess a thing, to have a thing, which is like this have. And the third one, which would be aru, which is a certain. Now, this is not really a verb. This is, it says here, it's a pre-noun adjectival. So this is not really a verb, not in the traditional sense. This also does not conjugate. So sometimes you'll see um, aru toki, which is like on a certain, at a certain time. Aru hi, which is at a certain day. Um, so this is not really the same. This is like a separate thing. It just happens to sound the same. But uh, really, grammatically speaking, saying that this is the same as this up here would be very confusing. So treat them as separate things. They just happen to look and sound the same. Um, which does happen, by the way, even in English. So don't be surprised. But um, aru aru. <laughs> aru aru. Yeah. Aru aru. Yeah, I feel like aru aru just is like, sore wa aru, like it happens, it's there. 
Although I don't know if it's, I would say aru aru is like uh, like ah oh, sorry aru like that that is there that exists that happens in that and then you just say it twice for emphasis, in my opinion. So um, to really understand, and maybe let's look at um, yeah let's look at the conjugation. Okay, so if you remember from last week, the four basic patterns of like conjugation are basically just the dictionary form or the non-past, the past tense, and then the negative non-past and the negative past tense. Natsuno de horo arigatou gozaimasu. Thank you so much for the follow. So let's look at these, okay? So we have, um, we have non-past. Again, I'm calling it non-past because I didn't go into depth um, about this terminology last uh, last week. I'm calling it non-past because it's more accurate than saying present tense. Because in Japanese, the non-past tense can function as a future tense as well. Um, and then we're going to look at like the positive and the negative of that. So let me make this table nice and neat like we did last week. Kind of like this, plenty of space. All right. So um, again, the reason that non-past is a little bit of better, a little bit more accurate than its terminology is that in Japanese, there doesn't really exist a future tense like in English. So in English, when we say I will eat, that is very clearly a future tense because I haven't eaten yet. Um, I eat is present tense usually. I will eat is future tense. Japanese is a little different. Japanese only really works in two categories. It works in has it happened yet or hasn't it? Um, if it has happened, that's past tense. Um, like, I ate, it's done, it's over, the action is completed. Then that's kind of present tense. And then I guess you could say, like, there's progressive um, the state of tenses, which we're going to get into, but not in this episode. But, like, the base, um, the two base levels are basically, like, has it happened or has it not? And if it hasn't happened yet, or it's about to, or it's in the future, that's basically always non-past tense, okay? So, for example, if I say the verb that we looked at earlier, which is um, taberu, which means to eat, taberu, well, I guess I should say, isn't the, the pitch on that would be like taberu, yeah, taberu. Um, taberu would be like to eat, right? I'll show it to you on screen again, uh, taberu. Yeah, so means to eat, right? Uh, forget about the second meaning for now, that's more of a metaphorical meaning, to eat. So if I say um, taberu, it means that usually that action hasn't actually happened yet. So you could say something like, ima kara gohan wo taberu. Like starting now, I will eat dinner. Where if we translate this, ima kara means starting now, from now on, from this moment on, gohan wo taberu, I will eat dinner. We use this non this non past tense, also often called like the dictionary form. If it's just the way it's written in the dictionary, that's often called the dictionary form. Easy to remember. That's like the that's usually just the non past, non conjugated base form of the verb. For for convenience, it's called the dictionary form. If you ever hear me say dictionary form, that's all I mean. I mean, what form does the dictionary list, basically, right? Like, if, if the dictionary, you can see it up here, if the dictionary says um, taberu is the dictionary form, then that's what we mean. It's like, that's as unconjugated as you can get, okay, basically. I'm native Japanese, but I'm surprised to know how confusing Japanese language is explained grammatically compared to English. Oh, do you think so? I think English is way more complicated. But yeah, I think it's a matter of perspective. Um, Grammar isn't all that bad, you know. You get used to it. It's it's kind of it's kind of satisfying if you look into it. <laughs> but I'm glad that uh, you can get some you get you can get something out of this. So again, um, w when we say like this this form, I would say it's like a non-past tense. Junsuke, I am more so this is Junsuke is a more Nihonjin than this. Yeah, English is difficult, but in terms of grammatically, Japanese is better. I think English is more complicated, but that aside. So, um, so that's what I meant, right? That's why I would say, um, let's call it a non-past tense rather than a, pa than a present tense, because present usually would like exclude the future, which in Japanese isn't really how it works. Often the non-past non tense is used for things that haven't happened yet. Actually, mostly. Okay, Japanese grammar is so different. English is interesting to learn. Indeed, it is. 
um, yeah, that's a big part of the fun for me as well because it is so different. It, it's uh, like it's actually really fun to look into. So uh, let's conjugate aru. Now aru is a bit unique because its conjugation, uh, mostly the negative conjugation, is very unique. Damn, I missed a lot. Don't worry about it, Ubox. This is recorded, um, so it'll be on YouTube eventually. And it's also in the VODs here on Twitch. So what is the non-past positive? Well, it's just aru. It's just the dictionary form. Um, aru. Aru. Now, the negative form is where it gets interesting. Um, like seriously mentioned, Aru is arguably kind of an irregular verb because its negative form actually turns into nai. So it changes completely. This is very unique. Um, it turns into nai. This is very unique. Aru is like the only verb that does this. Okay. Um, all other verbs actually then use nai to conjugate into their own negative form. That's very interesting in a way. This is not how it works in English. Well, Actually, maybe you could say this is almost exactly like it works in English now that I think about it. Because in English, to make a negative form, we rely on a word like not, right? Which is a whole separate word that we need to use to make it negative. Um, or don't, for example. I, I don't eat. I eat, I don't eat. Suddenly there's this other word in there that we, we need to use to make it negative. So maybe in a way, think of the nai a little bit like that this nai is what we're gonna use to make other verbs negative from now on and you'll see how this works in a little bit once we get into conjugation table for um ichidan verbs and then the past tense is um fairly straightforward um uses ta as well if you remember if, if you really remember from last week when we talked about adjectives a lot of these patterns are going to look super similar um luckily because it being similar once again means there's less new things to learn. So the past tense of aru is just atta. Um, I'm making this one white again because it's again a little bit more similar to its dictionary form, atta. And then this one here is instead of doing anything with the aru, we basically just put nai into its past tense. If you remember from last week, from something like oishiku nai, it just becomes nai nakatta. Nakatta is just the past of nai. Um, I said this last week as well, so all you do is nakatta. Um, that's a little bit of an ugly na there. Uh, na katta. Nakatta. Nakatta. There you go. Arimasu. Arimasen. Keigo ni naru to aru ga tsukaimasu ne. Hmm. Keigo janai to nai ni naru no homoshiroi. Yeah, that's true. So, like, the whole, um, polite stuff. Keigo to ka so yu no wa tene go mo sono ato ni setsume shi yo ka na to omotte mas kedo. I feel like the whole keigo and politeness will go into in a bit. Maybe I don't know. I'm feeling like making three parts just about verbs because it's so interesting. It's like this is where it's at. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're learning Japanese, once you learn verbs, um that's when you can put that meme, you know, the it's all coming together now. That's really how it feels. The more you know about verbs, the more you will understand Japanese, in my opinion. But this is where it's at, really. Um, conjugations and everything like that. So, this is the basic conjugations of aru. You have aru, you have nai, you have atta and nakatta, which means, basically, if we were to translate it as best as we can, is to be, uh, not to be, was, and was not. Kind of, you know, that's about as close as you're gonna get. Um, so there you go. Let's try and remember these. Most of all, try and remember from Aru, try and remember the ones in yellow. Try and remember Nai and Nakatta. But I do a low effort April Fools on my Twitter, also. Hi. <laughs> Sounds good, Janus. Um, okay, now let's look at Godan. All is kind of fire and finally understood all the. Oh my, one more scene there. Yeah, there you go. Um, Let's look at Ichidan, okay? So we're gonna look at Ichidan conjugation. Ichidan. So remember, once again, we will look at the non-past. There's more conjugations than this, but for now, these are the ones we're gonna look at. And the past tense. Oops. And we're gonna look at uh, positive and negative. 
Bleh. Ugly. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Wait. Okay, that's work. That works. Um, brush. There we go. A little bit less balanced than the last one, but that's fine. So, Aru to Nai, that is the question. <laughs> yes, to be or not to be, exactly. Um, so, Ichidan is easy, okay? Um, hold on to your chairs. Ichidan, you're gonna be like, ha, easy, give me something more challenging, and I'll, I'll give it to you um, after, in a bit. So, Ichidan, remember, all Ichidan verbs end in ru, okay? We all we know that it's some sort of some sort of verb. I'm gonna just do like a box and a V for verb and then a R, okay? That's that's like if we had to put a, a like um a pattern for Ichidan verbs, this is how they would look like. Some verb, some some like stuff, and then R. All of them end in R, always. There's no exceptions. Every Ichidan verb ends in R. Well, what do we do to make it negative? Easy enough, remember from um Aru. We take the verb, and instead of writing ru, we just replace that with nai. That's all we do. That's as easy as it gets. Nai. Okay, let's make an example, okay? Remember, um, taberu? Taberu, to eat? Well, what's the ru? The, the ru is all the way at the end, okay? So we have ta be ru. Imagine it in your in your head, the, the kana. ta be ru. I'll write it down for you so it's a bit easier. Um, so that you don't have to imagine. So we have ta and then we have ru. Taberu. So how you put it in negative form? Easy. Just replace ru with nai. Tabenai. 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 Not to eat. That that's all you need to do. And that's like if you think, wait, that is really easy. Then you're right. That's you'll see that ichidan conjugation is extraordinarily easy. Um, it's like, yeah, it's it's super easy. That's the nice thing about it. Um, what is past tense? Well, past tense is just as easy. Instead of replacing ru with nai, you replace ru with ta. That's all it is. Replace ru with ta. Tabeta. Done. That's past tense. Tabeta. It's all you need to know. It's super easy. What is negative past tense? Well, easy enough. Um, again, the age-old pattern, the same pattern that we used last week to conjugate adjectives, um, e-adjectives specifically, Instead of worrying about anything else, we just worry about, well, what's the past tense of nai? Because remember rem remember this overlying pattern is that Japanese works sort of in, in stages. Conjugation happens in stages. You do a conjugation to some stem form sometimes. Like, often it's a stem form, and then something gets added. So, um, like, this, this, this here is basically the stem form. This is basically the stem. And all we need to do is like change what we add to this. But wait, there's more. Yeah, tabenai, tabemasen, tabeta, tabetai. So, ne? Um so you basically have this stem, this tabe which which never changes. And that's why these are called ichidan verbs, okay? Ichi means one. Ichidan verbs only have one stem. Like, the stem of Ichidan verbs never changes. It always stays the same. No matter which conjugation you put there, Ichidan verbs always have the same stem. Their stem form, this tabe, everything before the ru, never changes. That's the easy part about Ichidan verbs. That's why Ichi, that's why one. There's only one stem. And now, of course, you can deduce Godan verbs have five stem forms, okay? Which sounds like a lot more, it's not too bad. Uh, there's actually a very neat pattern that we're gonna look at next week. So, ichidan is taberu, and then we just replace this ru with different things. So, tabe nai, okay? Um, and then, again, for the past tense, we have to think about what's the past tense of nai. It's nakatta, so we get verb plus nakatta, tabe nakatta, okay? That's all it is. Um, nakatta. Tabe nakatta. So again, this is this is what I'm this is what I want you to see is that conjugation happens in a way where you take a stem, like tabe is the stem, and again, because this is an ichidan verb, we know that the stem will never change, no matter which form we conjugate into. So we can just be like, okay. Well, if tabe is just the stem, then I can just start conjugating the ru only. So we go from taberu, we go to tabenai, which is not to eat. We go from taberu, we go to 
tabeta, which is did eat in the past. It's it's done. It's a finished action. So instead of ru, we use ta. And then the negative past is tabenakatta, did not eat, basically. Okay, that's the basic conjugation pattern for ichidan verbs. Now I see a lot of you in chat um, using things like tabemas and tabemasen and etc. etc. That's another thing that we're going to talk about. So I want to do this whole verb discussion in a in like a, a as logically as I can and as like a, a consistent or the most consistent way that I can possibly concoct for you to to make sense of this all. Which is why we're not going to talk about the mus today. Um, but potentially next week. Okay, so this is ichidan conjugation at its core, okay? There's more conjugations to this, but for ichidan, they'll all look something like this. They'll all be like, oh, you take the ru and you, you exchange it with something else. Now, very strictly speaking, this is basically the process of taking a verb, making a stem form, and then adding an, aux an auxiliary verb, right? So you could argue that um, nai is kind of like an auxiliary verb that makes the verb negative, okay? So if you look up the definition of auxiliary verb, it will usually show you something like a verb that is added to another verb to change its mood, tense, or something else, right? So it's it's a verb that changes a verb, kind of. And that's that's kind of how it works here. We have this nai that gets added and makes it negative. Uh, this is hard, but a little new to me as well. Yes, so Beth, um, I know you're probably doing a curriculum that uses the mus forms first, but I hope to <laughs> I hope to uh, bring you over to my side after this is um, after we're done with this sort of intro to verbs where you will see like, aha, uh -huh, maybe it's a little easier to do it this way around. I, I hope so. This is the goal. Um, I, I'm doing it this way because I genuinely believe this is easier um, and I hope that everyone watching this will sort of by the end of it agree with me that's I mean that's the point right if I think this is the easiest way to do it um, so by the end of this I hope that everyone will be like hey Eve was right this is easy so yeah um, let's hope that we can all be at that point in the next one or two weeks I think we should be there we should be at the point where like I understand conjugation now um, well, if you already agree, you're clearly in the VIP group, as, if, as you can see. All right, so now I think we're going to call it a day for this episode. And then next week, I'm going to talk about these four conjugations, but for Godan verbs. Okay. Um, and then maybe we can fit in mas next week as well. Maybe. I don't know. We'll see. I have to think about it. I, again, this verb thing is like super important to me. Um, this is, to me, this is the core. This is like the, the foundation upon which Japanese is built as far as I'm concerned. Um, so I want to do this right and I want to take my time and really get to everything that, you know, we need to figure out so that this makes sense. Um, next time, we're going to talk about godan verbs and we're going to look at a, this basically this similar pattern, but how it works with godan verbs. I already mentioned ichidan verbs have one stem form and godan have five. So that's why I'm postponing this because it will take a little bit to figure this all out. Those I want to talk about those five stems so that you can really build a strong connection to this term godan. Um, I feel like if you can do that, it becomes easier down the line. Um, so I want to take my time and then next week we're going to talk about Godan verbs. So I hope you'll be back next week. After this, I I think we'll play some Animal Crossing if you're okay with this. So maybe just chill for a bit. Um, also, I want to mention, shameless plug, but um, there is a... So I would like to... Um, yeah, there is a PDF document for these lessons. Um, there is one for every lesson up until and not including lesson number three because, again, I was... Uh, I was injured and I was under medication. I didn't have time to finish it. But I've been making um, little summary documents that are available for Twitch subs and Patreons. Just so you know, it's out there. You can get it if you subscribe. Um, it's in the Discord channel for Twitch subs. And I also send an email to the Twitch subs. And it's also on Patreon. Um, the first one of these is freely available to everyone. It is on our Discord. So if you want to check that out, you can join the Discord and see if that's something you're interested in. Um, and I can also probably find the link for you later for the people in chat right now. Um, it's also linked in the first episode of this on YouTube, if you're interested in that as well. 
So, if uh, you feel like, hey, this is really cool, then consider subscribing or just following as well and being back next week. I do this every Wednesday um, and also Friday and Saturday, uh, Friday and Sunday, we're going to be, um, yeah, we're playing games. I'm just going to need more example sentences, I'll get it. Yeah, so um, you can get um, <laughs> the cool kids retweet, that's true, yeah. Um, we're probably going to look at examples as well in a bit, but I feel like conjugation patterns are best learned as patterns. Like if you understand the pattern, you can understand every sentence ever. That's the nice thing about it. Okay, I will cut the recording now. Thank you very much for attending this. Remember um, the... Um, yeah, remember the stream will go on, so don't leave yet. But the recording will be over. Thank you very much for the people on YouTube. And um, yeah, I'll be back next week. No, thank you, dear audience. <laughs>